Welcome to the Kelton and Dust Museum and Garden. My name is George Ann Reuter, and today I'm going to be telling you about what life was like in the period of 1850 to 1900 through the eyes of the Fernando Cortez Kelton family. This home was built in 1852 by Fernando Cortez Kelton and his wife, Sophia Stone Kelton. Fernando came to Columbus as a young man and went to work for Sophia's father in dry goods and pharmaceuticals business on a wholesale basis. We lately have learned that they're distantly related, so it's possible that this was an arranged marriage. Fernando and Sophia fell in love, got married, and built their first home where the bus station is now, across from City Center. That home took, got too small for their growing family, so they decided to build what they called their home in the country. So think about that for a second. In 1852, this was considered the edge of town. Everything to the east would have been farmland. The road out front was a dirt road. But within about 10 or 15 years, the street had grown up. The people who lived here were in law, in business. One of the governors of Ohio, David Todd, lived a few houses to the west. It was an um, upper middle class neighborhood, well-educated people who raised their children to do good things in the community. This entry foyer has a few things of interest. We have a tall case clock that, that was built about 1780, 1790, a very old piece. The house in general uh, has very tall ceilings. Uh, the light would have been all from gas, and so these light fixtures are called gasoliers. Of course, we have electrified them so that we can uh, use appropriate codes from the 21st century. The sofa is a empire style sofa made out of horsehair, covered with horsehair, a popular fabric to cover furniture in this period of time. This is the front parlor of the Kelton family home. This is the room where the family would have done their formal entertaining. And so probably it would have been closed up uh, in times when they weren't doing entertaining because every room has a fireplace and that means that every fireplace has to be kept uh, going if you're going to be using that space. And this tells us something about what the homes were like. There was a lot of work, a lot of work to maintain the house, keep fires going, keep the house clean because coal, which they normally would have burned, was very dirty. Now in this room we have several family members who are uh, pictured. This is Oscar Kelton. Oscar was one of the children of Fernando and Sophia. Oscar was 18 when the Civil War broke out and he begged his mother and father to give him permission to serve, but they said no for a time. He finally convinced them that it was his duty and he joined the 95th Ohio Volunteer Infantry. His service uh, was uh, good. Uh, he uh, eventually became a lieutenant. He died at the Battle of Bryce's Crossroads in Guntown, Mississippi. And after the war, his father went down to Mississippi to retrieve his body. On that trip, Fernando suffered an accident. He fell out of his wagon and got a concussion. From that day on, he had dizzy spells. And one day after he returned to Columbus, he was in his office and he went to the window to get a breath of fresh air. He unfortunately suffered a dizzy, dizzy spell and fell out of his window and he died several days later. We know that he was considered to be a uh, well-respected man in the community because all the businesses closed their doors for his funeral and there was a meeting at the Neal House where all the friends and relatives gathered to talk about Fernando and his uh, good life. Now the room in terms of decoration is decorated in a style that would be appropriate for this family at this period of time. We don't know what the actual interior looked like. There were no photographs and apparently each time they put wallpaper up they took wallpaper down. And so what you see here today are window coverings, wall coverings, floor coverings that were available to a family in Ohio during this period of time. And the Kelton House Use and Design Committee selected appropriate um, materials so that the house would look like it might have looked for a family of this particular social status. The style is somewhat garish by, the, uh, by today's standards. This rug is a lot has a lot of detail and a lot of color, but the Victorians liked a lot of uh, 
uh, pattern, and one would almost say that they enjoyed a kind of wretched excess. As I mentioned, all of the lighting would have come from gas, and this very ornate gasolier was turned on by using this device to turn the gas on and off in each of the arms. There would have been a wick which was lighted, and you would have lit each of those uh, with this device. The chandelier was made by a company called Cornelius & Baker, which is the same company that made all the gasoliers in the State House. Very well-known company that only existed under that name from 1850 to 1860. So we know that this gasolier was actually original to the house. There are a couple artifacts that tell us something about life during this period. This is a screen to protect the delicate makeup that women of the period would have worn. The makeup apparently had a base that was uh, made of wax, and so if you got too near the fire, your makeup would sort of melt off. And so you could adjust the screen so that it was near your face to protect you from the heat of the fireplace. Behind the settee are two of the most uh, beautiful and interesting pieces of furniture in the Kelton House. This card table was made by Duncan Fife. It shows the hairy claw feet that is typical of a Duncan Fife piece. This is a chair in the style of John Henry Belter. Mr. Belter created the ability to laminate several thin pieces of wood and then expose it to steam, bend the wood, and then create the cutouts, which give it the very interesting motif. Also, sculptural pieces of fruit, flowers, other ornamentation was added to the furniture, and it became one of the most popular kinds of furniture of the period 1850 to 1900. The back parlor is the room where the family spent most of their time, and we have artifacts that illustrate those activities. The desk was one where one would, one would have done your correspondence. Obviously, there were no telephones, television, anything else that would automatically communicate it, so you need to write letters. Women spent a lot of time with their needlework, and so we have some of the materials that they would have used for that. The stereo optic viewer, or stereo opticon, was very popular. It was a device for viewing photographs, which were taken two at a time from a slightly different angle, and when viewed through the lens of the stereo opticon, produced a three-dimensional image. People didn't travel as much, so seeing slides of Niagara Falls or the Grand Canyon was very, very popular. We also have prayer books. The Kelton family was religious. They attended both the Presbyterian and the Episcopal Church, different members of the family at different times. We also have a cribbage board with a deck of cards inside. The family did like games, and games in general were very popular in the back parlor. Young people would have done playlets. They would have done other activities that would have been uh, what we would call, you know, just regular childhood activities. There were games where children would bob for apples or other activities like that where you would actively do kind of fun things. Obviously, reading was important. Anyone with who considered himself a gentleman would have his own library, and so we have books from both the 19th and the 18th century. We have other members of the family in this room. Uh, Fernando's, one of Fernando's sons, Edwin, was married to Laura Brace. Laura came from New York State and she brought with her quite a few pieces of furniture and family paintings. These are her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Brace, and this is her great-grandfather, Daniel Penfield. Daniel Penfield founded the town of Penfield, New York. He was originally from Manhattan, and he was a land speculator in New York State. And he wanted to move to New York, and actually his wife had no interest in what she said was a mosquito-ridden uh, part of the state. So he built her a fabulous house in a town that became known as Penfield, so it was his town. He was considered to be the uh, lead citizen of this particular family, and his portrait always hung over the fireplace. When we acquired these mirrors, we were very concerned because family stories said that if his portrait were ever taken off the wall, that the house would surely fall down. And so we very carefully moved Daniel to another place of honor in the back parlor. If you're looking up, you'll also see some unusual window treatments. 
These are actually parts of a bed that Sophia Kelton, the first lady of the house, had broken up by her carpenter. And he took all the parts and created pieces that were used for the window decoration. These are parts of the sideboards. And in the front parlor, we have part of the headboard and footboard. Over the very front window, that is part of what is called a half tester bed, where that would have been above where your head would be resting on a pillow, and then the drapery would have hung down so that you could be warm on those cold winter nights. So the family was very uh, frugal. They would not waste anything. On the desk is a portrait of Grace Kelton as a young woman with her dog, Danny. Grace had a series of dogs, and they were always called Danny. We also uh, know a lot about this particular desk it was originally part of a piano case. Grace Kelton purchased it on one of her trips to Europe to buy furniture for her clients. And this particular company, the John Broadwood Company, had been making pianos for composers and pianists in England for generations. And it's actually considered to be uh, one of the highest and best kinds of uh, pianos of this particular period of time. It also obviously had a much smaller keyboard than our current piano. Uh, but people who know pianos would look at that and know John Broadwood, absolutely. This is the Kelton family dining room. All the family meals would have been taken in this room. The kitchen was the room for preparation of food, not for eating of food. In fact, the kitchen would have been a very austere, simple area with a table for food preparation, and that is all. This door actually led to the butler's pantry but the butler's pantry had to be removed so that we could build a second set of stairs to uh, meet fire codes. But we do have two uh, closets, which include a lot of Kelton family china, silver, and crystal. The furniture in this room came to Columbus from New York State with Laura Kelton, and it is empire, covered in black horse hair. On the table, we have some Kelton, some non-Kelton material. The tablecloth was a gift to the Kelton house, as was the silverware, but everything else on the table actually belonged to the Kelton family. The sideboard is a Sheraton-style sideboard, and above it is a portrait of one of the Penfield family relatives, Charlotte Gelston, and at her neck, she is wearing a piece of jewelry that's made out of human hair. That jewelry, piece of jewelry, is actually in this framed piece right on the sideboard. Women would save their hair and they would create jewelry in order to uh, create something that was intrinsically theirs and they would trade jewelry. Or let's say your mother had created a piece of hair jewelry and she passed away, you would wear her jewelry as a sign of your mourning for her. And they actually called it mourning jewelry. Now the room itself is a wonderful reflection of the Victorian aesthetic. A lot of pattern on the floor, on the walls. Uh, the woodwork is faux grained, a light oak. During this period of time, they liked to paint their woodwork to look like a different kind of wood. In the restoration period of the house, we asked for a consultation with the National Park Service, and they came and did the test to find out what was the first layer of paint. And they told us that it would have been painted a light oak. So we have recreated that light oak faux graining. And it adds to this um, combination of pattern that makes this room very beautiful. This was done by a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Robson, who is a fifth generation grainer and marbler from England. And he brought his 15 year old son, who will be a sixth generation grainer and marbler, to do the work in this room. This is one of the only non original fireplaces in the Kelton house. Apparently, Grace Kelton had removed the original fireplace and had installed a colonial style fireplace. And so this was found in a house that had been torn down and was installed here at the Kelton house. Charlotte Gelston's portrait has actually been repainted. As she aged, she would have had her portrait repainted to reflect how she looked as an older woman. And if you look very closely, you can see remnants of the earlier painting underneath. I actually think I would not like that. I would rather be remembered as a young woman, thank you. But that was the style of the day. On the table, we have cloth napkins. And as you probably would recognize, paper napkins did not exist at this period of time. 
obviously they needed to be cleaned. And there were certain rules about how often you should wash your napkins because you didn't wash them every day. It was a lot of work to do that. And so you would have put your napkin in your napkin ring with your initials on it so that it could be put aside for day two, day three, so that you didn't get your brother's dirty napkin back again. After day three, in a well-run household, you were supposed to wash the napkins. Above the windows, you will find stamped brass balances, which Grace Kelton had created during her lifetime, and they're very much like those that you'll find in the house of Mary Todd Lincoln. This is the sitting room or reception room. Women would go to a special room where only women would uh, have conversation. And this particular room is very patterned again. We have a lot of that same repetition of pattern and kind of wretched excess. On the walls are several pieces that are of interest to both Columbus history and the family history. This is the lithograph showing the funeral procession of President Lincoln. After Lincoln was assassinated, they put his body on a train, and he visited about seven or eight different cities. And in each city, the body was taken, train, put in a place of honor, and all the local citizens would come and pay their last respects. They say that on this day in Columbus, over 50,000 people walked by the body of the president, which is about twice as many people as lived in Columbus. So we get an idea of how important this day was in history. Fernando Cortez Kelton, who built this house, was one of the 14 honorary pallbearers who walked beside the president's body. He wore this badge, and this is a piece of the armband that he wore that day. So this gives us some indication that Fernando was one of the important gentlemen in Columbus. Anna Kelton, another of the children of Fernando and Sophia, kept a scrapbook for a period of 10 or 15 years. And this scrapbook is probably the most important first generation piece of evidence that we have about the history of this family. It includes very sad things like the telegrams the family received letting them know that Oscar had died in the Civil War. Opposite are newspaper clippings describing the battle at Bryce's Crossroads where he died. Other things that she saved were much more frivolous. If she went to a play, she would save the program. If they traveled and there was some plant material that was not available in Columbus, they would take it and press it. There were calling cards of friends. There were bereavement calling cards. Apparently after someone passed away, they would have a card that uh, recorded that event. And so she saved that sort of thing. We have it in a special case so that the sun doesn't deteriorate it and we actually cover it with black cloth to continue to preserve it. The third generation that lived in this house were the daughters of Edwin and Laura Kelton. These five girls, there were no boys, lived in this house and most all of them died here. Um, in the back row is Grace Kelton, next to her Ella, Laura, Lucy, and Louise. Grace Kelton was an interior designer. She had gone to New York to study to be an illustrator. She had worked for a newspaper in New York for several years and then came back to Columbus and she taught at what is now Columbus College of Art and Design. After a while, the field of interior design uh, was developing and it was a career you could actually study for. So when she went back to New York to study to be a designer and then came back to Columbus and set up her practice. She was Columbus's first interior designer. She worked for Columbus's important families as well as commercial entities in the city. Two of the girls got married. Two other of the girls did not. Uh, they all had careers. By the time they were adults, there was not so much money that they could live without working. One was a dietitian, and the other had a business called the Home Cleaning Service. She didn't scrub up people's fireplaces, but what she did was to close down their house when they were going to make the grand trip to Europe, cover the furniture, get rid of all the food, and then she would reverse the process when they came back to the city. The Kelton family was strongly abolitionist, and this home was a stop on the Underground Railroad. We know of one particular family, that was sheltered here. Sophia Kelton found Martha Hartway hiding in the bushes outside the Kelton house when she was 10 years old. She was with her sister Pearl and they were on their way to Canada, which was the only place one could be truly safe because of the laws that made it all right to take back fugitives that had escaped. Martha was taken in and she was sickly. Pearl went on toward Canada, but because Martha couldn't travel, she stayed here. She actually stayed for 10 years. 
She probably lived in the servants' quarters. She was treated somewhat like a family member, but probably also worked around the home. She met Thomas Lawrence, who was a free black carpenter who worked for Mr. Kelton. And they were married here in the Kelton parlor 10 years later. The fact that they were married in this house's parlor, I think, really speaks for itself. They had become very close to the Kelton family. They named their first son, Arthur Kelton Lawrence, and he became a pharmacist and actually then went back to school and became a physician, and he was Columbus's first black physician. In this case are photographs that the Lawrence family had in their attic, and they became uh, interested in the Kelton family later because they heard of Grace Kelton, and they actually didn't know Grace that those many generations later, but um, James Lawrence, who is in his 80s now, had a wife who was very inquisitive, and she had heard of Grace Kelton, and she's seen these pictures in the Lawrence attic, and she said to her husband, well, who are these white people that you have pictures of? And he told her, and she said, well, I know of a Grace Kelton. She's an interior designer. I'm going to call her up. And so Ruth Lawrence called Grace Kelton in 1975, and Grace said, I always wondered what happened to the children, the grandchildren of Martha and Thomas, because our family has told this story for years. So we have a story that has been passed down both by the Lawrence family and by the Kelton family. The Lawrences came and had tea with Grace Kelton, and she died six months later. The Lawrences came to Grace's funeral, and they told the members of the Junior League of Columbus, who they were considering taking on this responsibility, about the fact that this house had been on the Underground Railroad. The other people in this display are Frank Kelton, who would have been about the same age as Martha and Thomas, and we have a book that he used to learn to read that was passed down to their son, Arthur Kelton Lawrence, and both of their names are in this book. So we have an artifact that very graphically displays the relationship between these two families. We also have a picture of Colonel James Watson, who was the husband of Ella Kelton, and they sold property to Martha and Thomas several times. And we probably can presume that this is property that they couldn't have purchased directly themselves, being black. So again, we have another example of the supportive relationship between the Keltons and the Lawrences. Grace Kelton's will specified that this home would become a museum of the decorative arts and local history. If that didn't happen within six months, the house was going to be torn down and a park installed on this site. Nobody wanted that to happen, and so there was quite an effort to find an organization that would take on the responsibility of restoring the house and maintaining it and operating a museum of local history. There are four family bedrooms. We have restored two of them. In this particular bedroom, there are artifacts that really make clear how difficult life might have been during this period of time. Of course, there was no running water in this house. All the water would have been pumped. And we have a kind of bathtub that might have been used. There were obviously larger bathtubs, but this particular kind was called a hip bath. You would have sat on the edge and just kind of washed up with the water that's in, in the tub. It was very common for more than one person to bathe in the same water. And I'm going to guess that the father got to go first. There's an expression called uh, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater," and we think that it comes from the fact that the water would have been so dirty by the time the last person bathed that you might not have actually seen the baby, therefore the statement. We also have towels with the Kelton girls' uh, initials on them, and like the napkin rings, you would want your own towel back again. You probably wouldn't wash your towel every day. That way, you've got your own towel. So the things that we think of as fancy and kind of affectations actually have a very practical purpose. This is the gentleman's shading stand. Obviously, you would want to be as close to the light so that you could see well. Gentlemen would have shaved daily, but you also see a lot of men with full beards, and this is probably why. Shaving was somewhat difficult. The daily hygiene would have been washing with water, soap and water, you would have a bowl and a pitcher, and your daily hygiene would have been done there. Uh, probably the bath was a once-a-week activity. 
This screen was put together by Grace Kelton. In her adult life, she participated with a group of interior designers on the redo of the interior design of the White House when Jacqueline Kennedy did it. This particular paper was a paper that was actually used in the White House Library, and there were some leftovers, so Grace brought it home and created the screen. These are scenes from Niagara Falls. The other scenes in the library are other important American locales like uh, Annapolis and the like. In this bedroom, we have displayed what the summer would be like in the Victorian home. There were no screens on the window, and so you would need mosquito netting to protect yourself from the overnight attack of mosquitoes. You also would have put a grass matting on the floor uh, and sort of covered up your furniture with muslin covers to give it a different look during the summertime. We also have a very small closet, and there were very few closets in the Victorian home. This particular one was only a few inches deep. In general, clothes were kept instead in a wardrobe freestanding piece of furniture where you would have stored all your clothing. Obviously they did not have nearly as much clothing as we have. This particular piece of furniture is called a fainting couch, a kind of strange name, uh, and it relates to the fact that women would wear such tight corsets that they would have fainting spells. They actually carried smelling salts in their purse in case they might faint away. And so you have a piece of furniture with the name fainting couch. On the dresser, we have the normal accoutrements that a woman might have used, brushes and combs. You also have a uh, hair receiver or a hair saver. You may remember that we talked about hair jewelry. Well, you needed a receptacle to collect your hair until you got enough. And so you actually would have a piece of uh, porcelain. It would have had a lid. Ours has been broken. But you see that there's actually hair in it and there's a weight to keep it down. This uh, particular piece was meant for the gentleman to put his change in, but this part was actually for him to hang his pocket watch on. Wristwatch had not yet been invented, and so all gentlemen would carry a pocket watch. The last generation of women who lived at the Kelton House were not married, and so the normal accoutrements of childhood, we don't have a lot of. We have received some gifts, and they look like children's toys, but actually these are salesman samples of furniture. The salesman would have carried around the small samples so that he could sell the full-size version. We have some dolls that were given to us, some small uh, booties, shoes, and some other accoutrements of childhood, but these are all gifts. This wardrobe contains articles of clothing that were part of the Kelton family. This particular nightshirt has Edwin Kelton's name on it. These collars are called fish shoes, and they were used to change the look of a particular piece of clothing. That way you might have only one dress, but you could change the collars and give it a new look, and you'd have a second whole costume. This grouping of photographs shows Grace Kelton at a variety of times during her life, her childhood, her very young years, sort of the mature interior decorator, um, Grace in her older years, and then this was probably taken shortly before she passed away. She's again with her dog, Danny. Grace Kelton always created her own Christmas cards, and this collection shows the original drawings that she would have used, and then the actual card that resulted. My favorite is the one right after she's retired, and she says, believe it or not, Merry Christmas, how to retire. Unfortunately, Grace never really did retire. Even after she officially retired, there were certain members of the community that could not choose their own wall coverings without her, and so even after her death, fabric was delivered that she was selling to various clients. The carriage house almost was condemned. The Structurally, it was falling down. We had to go to city council and ask for an extension of the, uh, the 
order to tear it down and had a year to make it safe. And what ensued was a plan to use the space for meetings, for rentals, special events, weddings, and receptions, and at the same time to maintain as much of the historical integrity as possible. So the whole carriage house was totally torn down. There were poles holding up the roof. The brick was totally rebuilt. The three glass arched windows looking up to the patio, the garden, and the driveway side were created uh, using a form that had been in the original carriage house, a curved brick motif. We added doors so that it could be accessible on both sides. There always was a fireplace, but it originally opened to the other side, probably where the laundress would have worked. We know that eventually this became a garage. Grace Kelton garaged her car here. She was known to be a little bit of a bad driver. The doctor told her to stop driving, so she got a new doctor. The um, stones that are in the front of the fireplace were actually stones that were part of the rubble construction of the original carriage house. We are not positive where fugitive slaves would have hidden in the Kelton house. Family history says that they hid in a cistern, a cistern being an underground tank for the collection of water. When a cistern was free of water, it would be certainly large enough for a fugitive slave to hide in. Because we no longer have a cistern, we have created a faux hiding place in our basement. Probably all people during this period of time used their basements as a root cellar, would have been the place where vegetables and fruits would have been stored over the winter keeping them as fresh as possible, and seems like a likely place for fugitives, runaways to hide. In this space, we have a program called the Underground Railroad Learning Station. Students from Fort Hayes Arts and Academic High School come and they portray Martha Hartway the moment she would have awoken the first time in the home of Sophia Kelton. She and her sister Pearl talk to the Kelton children, and through their conversation, our visiting children, our third and fourth graders who are sitting along the bench, they learn about what life would have been like on the Underground Railroad. After the play, the students take a short tour of the museum, and then they are read a fictional account of the Underground Railroad and do a workbook which uses the Underground Railroad to test some academic pursuits that are appropriate to their fourth grade proficiency tests. During other parts of the year when we don't have the students performing the play, we have information about slavery, about the rise of the abolitionist movement, the important people who helped bring slavery to an end. We have a map showing the various paths to freedom, how runaways would have run away depending on where they were in the South. We have Ohio's participation, various role, plus we have local safe houses in Central Ohio and our own Kelton Lawrence family story. Good. Many people ask about the brick curved arch, the inverted arch that is here and in the other two parts of this wall along the front of the house. We invited a class of architects to come during the 1980s and they had some possibilities but none of them were actually found to be particularly accurate. There is also a home in Akron, Ohio that has the same thing. Their story is that these were installed to counteract the force of an earthquake. And so if a force came from the ground, these arches would help to stabilize the house. And these are actually underneath our windows in the front and our front door. The state of Ohio also has these in the state house. And they say that they are to spread the weight of the massive columns across the uh, the total expanse of the foundation as opposed to having the weight all coming down in one spot. Whether or not any of these theories are correct, I think that they were all believed to be correct in the 19th century, and so we must presume that the Keltons were trying to do one of these things which would have stabilized their home. Thank you for visiting the Kelton House Museum and Garden. We'll see you then.